Isn't that cool? Now that video obviously is a little different. Instead of having me on scene, uh, bringing my Philadelphia accent in real time, we started to film in Palazzo Mir too, and then they said, uh, ladies, can you cool it? So I settled for still pictures instead. But I'll tell you what, what we're talking about tonight and why those pictures matter. And I hope they give you a little bit of look because what Palazzo Mir 2 is, it's in Palermo and those are pictures I took and it is a real life home of the noble Mir 2 family. And look, I'm writing historical fiction. And so we like to kind of demystify that process for you and give you my trade secrets in these things. So when you're gonna write historical fiction, as much as you love Philly, you can't do it in Philly. I think you actually, for me, I have to pay a visit. I have to go there. I had to see Palermo. And since I was going to have characters that were of the upper class in loyalty, I had to see how the upper class lived. And you have a million little questions what what do the dishes look like? Do they use silverware? What do the walls of the place look like? What are what fabric are they covered in? You know, it was interesting because during the time period the, the novel is in the 1810, 1840, throughout then, there was a kind of a rage about chinoiserie, Asian uh kind of like uh, statues and rugs and silks from that area. It, became, it was actually part of, if you know any Gilbert and Sullivan, you know, all of that topsy-turvy period. Victorian England and parts of Sicily thought it was very, very chic and fashionable to love things that were from the Far East. And so they, you saw the room about that. You saw the way they dressed. You saw the beautiful frescoes painted on the wall, the rugs, and the most, and the coolest thing about it is when you're not only taking in all of this, right? Because I had to see it to put it in the book, and it's in loyalty in spades, right? But when I'm there, I'm noticing the architecture. I will point out to you, and this is like you know how I love to teach, but also I love to learn, and I know readers love to learn. So when I'm there, I see in Palazzo Mir too the architecture. My dad was an architect. I noticed the architecture. And in fact, it's my job to know all that stuff because I have to put it in loyalty, right? So I noticed that there's a particular setup of the hallway and all the doors are one after the other. It looks like this. Do you see this? Does this look familiar to you? How, isn't this in almost every movie you've seen from Barry Lyndon, all kinds of period fiction that's set in Europe, whether it's Britain, Italy, France, Germany, they always have this setup. They have, if you remember, you can visualize it, it's elegant, it's drop dead gorgeous. It's room after room after room with a door in between and they're always walking through the room like Kate Blanchett, like somebody really classy and cool, always walking through these rooms. Now, when I find those rooms in Palazzo Mir too, and I saw them in homes of the rich people that I toured in Palermo, I said, Lisa, you have to have this in the book. This is characteristic of the 1800s. It's characteristic of nobility of Sicily. But then I was like, what is it called? Because in the end I have to come home and write it and I'm like, well, I type like this, but it's like there are rooms after rooms after rooms. And I start to look around. And also it's important for me to know what that term is, because my characters who are upper class in the novel would know that term. Sure enough, I look it up. And next time you see this in any movie, you will know that the term for rooms laid out in this fashion is an enfilade. It's a French word. These rooms are enfil enfiladed. In, in, in our pronunciation, room after room after room. And the term comes from, actually an enfilade is French for a, a line of gunfire, gunfire. So for example, if there was a trench and you were shooting, it's horrific to think, but this is where the term came from, had a military origin. You're gonna shoot people in a trench and the trench goes right, right in a line, just like it does in those hallways, you'd shoot right down the line. Well, that's what those, that's the way those rooms are set up. It's an enfilade of rooms. And I was so lost in that and loving that. And all of that, the structure, the things they used, the beautiful curtains, the, the delicate uh, inlaid iron and also ivory and different types of wood and all this ornate Baroque Italianate distinctly Sicilian architecture and articles, kind of like you, it infuses you and then you take it 
and you poured all of it into the book, but more importantly too, not only that atmosphere, but it informs the characters, doesn't it? Do I like to make my room, like we are sitting in front of all my signed books, because I love books around me, because your environment creates a mood, doesn't it? I think it's really important to make your place wherever you are, to try to make it nice and feeling like you, so you feel good in it. What kind of mood is created by a stiff, formal, super decorated room? And I started to think about what it was like, and my research showed me what it was like to be a noble person in Sicily. So I have a character in loyalty. I don't want to tell you that much about her, but it was really interesting because from the outside, she has everything. She is a noble woman. She's rich. She has all of these great dresses, like some of which I tried to show you there. You know, damask and toile and crinoline and boussiers and all these things that are really like, you know, just the kind of stuff you want. You know, the kind of like Bridgerton kind of thing, right? Oh my God, the curls, the fussiness. She's a very beautiful woman. But when you start to examine her life, when you really get into those enfiladed rooms and you try to imagine what it's like, you start to understand that in the 1800s to be a woman in Sicily looked maybe good from the outside, but not so good from the inside. And this is true even of a noble woman. Women weren't supposed to go outdoors without, they were not allowed outdoors without escorts. They were not allowed out certain times. They were considered property. Young girls did what their father told them. They went from their father's house to their husband's house or to a convent. They didn't have any say over what, how, what money was spent. They had to give a diary. In fact, we talked before about dowries and convents. Do you know that people, noble women who were sent to convents, they actually had a convent dowry. They were theoretically brides of Christ. Their father gave their inheritance to a church and they were sent to a convent. And so I really wanted to explore that because this is a novel, as we've talked about before with Franco, we start with Franco, who's a young man who can't move up because the class system in Sicily is so oppressive that you can't move up to it. But it's also oppressive, especially to women, if you look at it from the inside, from the top down. And in a way, there is no better example of that in real life, and we talked before about this tragic story, than a person named Prince Tomasi de Lampedusa. Let me tell you about him because he was a real life person and he's not in loyalty like some of the other real life people in Sicily at the time, but here's a picture of him. What a little cutie. He was born in 1859 in Palermo. He is a prince. He was a real like prince. He was the Prince of Lampedusa. He was the Duke of Palma. He was a Spanish grandee. He had a lot of titles. He was born to one of the wealthiest families in all of Italy, not to mention Sicily. And he grew up in Palermo. He was schooled in Rome. He had a bit of a depressive bent. It's from what you can understand about him, and there's actually been his life novelized, this wonderful book called Lampedusa about him. You know, he felt that he really didn't have the freedom that he wanted because secretly what he wanted was to write a novel. And his voice was unexpressed all his life because he didn't feel that he could do it. The confines of his class confined him. At the same time, even though he lived in a castle and should have been happy, he wasn't. In fact, World War I came and went, World War II came and went, World War II, if you remember from Eternal, the Allies, us, we entered through Sicily. We landed in Sicily and moved upwards. One of the things we did was bombed his castle, which sent him into an even deeper depression. Now I know you're tempted to go, yeah, we bombed your castle, that's still sad. By that point though, Italy had switched. So basically it's still tragic. He was tragic and it was sad and he still couldn't get this book out of him, but he started to, towards the end of his life, thank God I'm not getting any younger. And he sort of fell in with some younger people who were poets and everything. And they encouraged him and bottom line, he decides at about, let me, I wrote down the date, I think it's 1954, that he's gonna write this novel because he's a prince and he says to himself, I have something to say as a prince about being a prince. And so he sets out to write a book. The book he writes is called The Leopard. It is written by Giuseppe Tomasi de Lampedusa, a prince 
about a fictional prince, Prince of Selena in Palermo. And he sets it in his house. That's why I came upon it at first, because it was a description bit by bit of all of the beautiful trappings of wealth, the clocks, the inlaid tables, the special chinoiserie, the gorgeous feuds, the silverware, the dresses, the balls, all the stuff of nobility. And here's the prince, real prince of, Lamp of Lampedusa, trying writing about the prince of Selena. He writes the book. It takes him about two years. He writes to two publishers. He can't get it published. He has a friend of me. We won't go into the details. Bottom line, the book doesn't get published and he dies a year later. The next year, posthumously, a friend, a good friend of his, sends the book to a publisher. It gets published. The Leopard, the story of Prince Selena, written by the Prince of Lampedusa, becomes the best selling novel in Italian history. Still, it was published in 1958. It is still, it is the quintessential story of Sicily. It is set during the time of loyalty. So it was incumbent upon me and actually my great pleasure to read it. I got it in this edition because if you, I know you guys are book lovers. So meanwhile, can we just take it aside to say, how much do you love little books like this that have this? I frigging love the little ribbon. I don't even use a bookmark. I, I'm sad, I, I hate to admit to you, but I dog your pages. But, and sometimes I write in pages like I wrote in that one. But this, it's like a little prayer book. And God, don't we just worship books? So I, it has a little ribbon. In any event, I'm digressing. This is a beautiful book. It's poetry. You can totally envision what it's, I said invagine. You can totally envision what it's like to have been the prince. You can imagine what it's like to live in the upper crust of Sicily, but you can also imagine how confining it is. There are women in this book. They feel so confined. Their only choice is who they marry, and they don't even get to make that choice. His life, in a way, is emblematic of the downside of, be of being in those upper classes. And in fact, a lot of this book is about the stuff of loyalty, because in this was a very time, turbulent, turbulent time period, as we said before, in Sicily, because people like Franco were making life hell for people like this nobleman because they wanted to move up and they couldn't. And a lot of this book is about the change, the change of Sicily, the, the change, the upheaval in the class system and how it feels to be a prince at that time, to not really want to do have been a prince, but also to have lived that life and understand that that way of life is going and must go, but still to mourn it, that great bittersweet wrench of what that's like is really brought to life in this novel. It's the reason I think that it is such a popular novel. You could still read it today and feel the poignance of it, the, the realism of it. He knows exactly what he's talking about because he is that. And also the pathos that he had in, in, in his soul. It's just incredibly moving. I loved it. And you will see when you read loyal, when you read loyalty, how much of the Prince of Lampedusa is in there, particularly in this female character who really bemoans her fate. Yes, she has a meal. Yes, she has nice dresses, but she has no choices and she lives in a cage. Now, I wanna mention one other thing, which because part of the thing I got into too, and I know you love this stuff too, because listen, this is the Martha Stewart part of our show. So one of the things I did while I was over there is went shopping because I also wanted to see what upper class people of the time bought. You know, I wanted to see what it looked like and what it felt. And you could see some of the museums, you couldn't touch it. But I found a little tiny shop in Palermo that sold beautiful, beautiful linens. And this actually in particular, and this was a custom of the upper class at this level, but also was for all the classes in Sicily, because this, these are actually, and these are actually wedding sheets. I know it sounds a little weird, but it was really a lovely, lovely tradition. And this is what the upper class people would have had, because what you did then is you had for your wedding night, I can't remember my <laughs> friggin' night, but anyway, um, you had these beautiful sheets that with this incredible embroidery. This was really, this was kind of expensive. It was expensive at that time too, all done by hand. 
done by the lower classes for the upper classes for their beautiful freshly made beds on their wedding nights of course peasantry would try to have something like that would have something much less um fine and refined as this in fact i read somewhere that part of the tradition was that the peasantry would have virgins make the bed with whatever sheets they had because they couldn't afford these things but if you could see what these are like i don't know if you can see it but it's so gorgeous. And those of you who do any kind of needle craft, I'm a big needle pointer. I collect quilts. The batting on this, the lace, the do it. Look at this. It's stunning. It's all handmade and it's a beautiful, beautiful sheet. I can't bring myself to put it on the bed because dogs sleep on my bed and I would never forgive myself. But I did bring it home to show it to you and just to experience it and have it forever because it's the coolest thing ever. So that's what we end ended up talking about tonight. Nobility, Sicily, how it may look great from the outside, but it always isn't always great. And you'll see all of that in loyalty. We'll put this video on the website. By the way, let me just mention, we are going to have the most amazing thing on the website. I don't know if you saw our website for Eternal, but we had a map of all of the locations in that took place in the book. Well, we're going to do something similar, only even better. Props to Laura, who has been busting her butt. All of these pictures I've taken, all of these videos, you will be able to go to the map on the website and you and your book club or just yourself, that's okay too, because I know you guys are naturally curious, that's why you're here, um, can look and see what it actually looked like then, what it looked like now, where it is in the city, where it is in the country of Sicily, because we started in Palermo, but we're gonna wander all over in loyalty and we will. So I wanted to bring that up. Now, getting to the contest part of our show, but, I have to tell you the nice thing somebody said about my book, because you know, I'm not shy about that. I'm actually very, very proud. As I've told you before, these are galleys. That's what they call them publishing, which is like a pre, pre-pub pre book. It won't be out till March 28th, but the publisher is nice enough to make these. And we send them all around and say, if you like this, will you say something nice? And happily, a wonderful independent bookstore, Newtown Bookshop, with those of you in the Philly area will know this incredible independent bookstore, Kathy Morrison is just terrific. They're a wonderful independent. So please support your bookstores. We need bookstores in our communities. We need just for fun, for love and for literacy and to keep saying to each other, these things matter. Nurturing yourself matters. Books matter. Kathy Morrison said of loyalty, masterful storytelling, fast paced, extremely interesting. You just have to read loyalty. It's so it's such a nice thing to say, particularly because booksellers read everything. And to get a nice quote like that, I was really, really over the moon when it came in. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Newtown Bookshop. And please, please support Indies and support any bookstore you can in your community. They're so, so important. The last thing I want to tell you, and that before we get to the thank you part of our show, is Pigeon Tony's Last Stand. A little Rosado short story is on Amazon Prime. Please get it. Get an audio, it's phenomenal. Uh, Eduardo Ballerini read it. He actually is the reader of the audio book for Loyalty, which is sensational. Oh my God, he's so good, I requested him. You might remember the name because he, um, he read Eternal. He also read Bennett's. And by the way, do you know what other book he read? He read The Leopard. He narrated the audio book of The Leopard. And it is breathtaking because he's breathtaking. I am so thrilled. I love audiobooks. I love the way the Pigeon Tony story turned out in audio. You can hear him voice Pigeon Tony. He's a native Italian speaker. He speaks it beautifully. He can even do Sicilian, and he does in loyalty. Sicilian is not Italian, as you know from our very first lesson. So I um, obviously have gone and on, but I had a lot to tell you, and I am so excited to be back home and so excited to see you all again. Thank you so I'm reading that now. Good, Kathy. I really appreciate it. You guys are just the best. I really appreciate you. That's what the contest is all about. What the contest is about is just to say thank you for your support. I don't get to be in this job for 30 some years and 30 some books without your support. And you have supported me. Here I am, something completely new historical fiction, but we've talked about how it's not really completely new. I'm always writing about family. I'm always writing about love and I'm always writing about carbohydrates. Those are my themes. So this is, uh, this is all a way of saying, Thank you very, very much for, for your support, for your kindness, for your love. I love you. I appreciate you. And I'll see you next Monday. Thank you very, very much again. And we start in our countdown. 
to Pub Day for Loyalty. Thank you and stay well till next time. Bye-bye.